Greater New York Academy welcomes you to our weekly chapel worship service, where we worship God in the beauty of holiness. Join us live on YouTube every Monday and Thursday. As we worship together, we are... Tony Walker! Mr. Valse, oh, Mr. Valse, you're not, you're not preaching today. Miss V, is she one on, Miss V, I'm gonna get you. Mr. Arias, let's give him a hand. Enter to serve. Mrs. V, and Mr. V, you're one over here. Come on up. Miss Deanna Ryan, let's give her a hand. Miss Theodore Ryan, to the right. Miss Moldavia McAlpine. Um, Vice Chair of the Religion Department. Mr. Walter Savaslai. Mr. S. And Mrs. Santiago, please, please come, Miss Santiago. On your right, Mrs. Elliot. Right. And our beloved pastor, who got us in all of this, Pastor Ed Carlo Alexander. Woo! All right. I think we're ready to go. Mrs. Elliot, are, are we ready? Okay. Yeah. So, all right. No problem. All right. Let's begin. Preach. Okay. Now we have a video coming up. And after the video, song service. And we'll roll. So, um, for today's Greater Game Fest, we have a couple of tournaments. My colleagues here will be able to do, um, tell you the tournament rules and what we're going to be doing for them. Alright. Okay, so for Smash Bros, the rules is three stocks, no items, Smash Meter. There, it's a three minute timer, 1v1s, and there's only 32 players max. Alright, so the rules for 2K is a 2v2 tournament. So for example, it's two players, so Asia and I versus Joshua and Terrence, right? Right? So it's five minutes per match. Most points at the end of five minutes wins. All-star difficulty. Each person has to choose their own player. You have the ability to change players. There's only 16 team slots available. So you have to start putting your teams together so then we can get your applications by Thursday. All right, awesome, awesome. Well, yeah, so um, the deadline for all these registrations, for you to give in your packages, for you to give all your information, it is 4 p.m. on Wednesday. So if you, come, 
If you come in and say that you want a package, we're sorry, but we can't accept that. 4 p.m. this Wednesday, that is the deadline for all registration, all applications. Yes, there will be an email. Um, there will be a survey sent out to all of you guys so that you guys can apply. Please get it in by Wednesday, 4 p.m. So yeah, this is what we're doing for the Greater Game Fest. Huh? Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> and one last thing for all, the, for all the people who've been asking, yes, there will be dress down. That will be included in, all, in every single package. So don't worry all about that. All right, guys, so for more information, you can see any one of these individuals here or myself. And Sarai put together a short video of the games we'll offer in our Game Fest. And now we will view the video, and we hope you enjoy. Thank you, sophomores. Yeah, that, that video was very well done. Uh, yeah, shout outs to the print eye, Sarai. Bless her, bless her. All right, uh, very brief announcement, ladies and gentlemen, Tuesday and Wednesday will be our map test days. Uh, we'll have two sessions on Tuesday, morning and afternoon, from nine to 12, and then from one to four. And then on Wednesday, we'll have a session from nine to 12. Uh, so you'll be getting Zoom link information from your sponsors who will be proctoring your exams. So you'll need two devices, one that you'll use to be in the Zoom call, and then the other that you'll use for the map test. All right, and uh, once you get into the Zoom call, we'll give you all the login information you'll need to access the exam. Cool? Yeah. All right, blessings, guys. Have a good one. Okay, Greater New York Academy, our final announcement and a, on a different note. Um, everybody know that the greatest, the greatest mission of the school is to help to save souls, to see others, see students come to the kingdom of Christ. Amen? Amen. I want us to know that one of our students, one of our own, uh, one of our seniors will be getting baptized at the end of this year. Um, 
at the, at the end of this semester on June 5th. Uh, we know as a family, when one of us take that step, we want to support. You will have the information on how to support, whether online or in person. But another reason for this announcement is because there might be others who are contemplating, who are in the valley of decision. There might be one other student, whether online or in person, who knows that God has been calling you to take that step, make that full commitment. Um, you're invited to reach out to any of us, speak to any teacher, the principal, myself, send us a message. Um, if you want to be a part of that baptism or um, any other baptism, please let us know. We really don't want to end the year and an opportunity has been missed. Understood? So pray, pray for your fellow student and also um, we encourage you to take that step in the, in the Lord. It's, it's the best decision that anyone could make. God bless you. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for waking all of us up this morning. Please let us enjoy this chapel and learn something from it. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, the first and only song will be, Oh, Magnify the Lord. Amen. Oh, magnify the Lord. Oh, magnify the Lord. Stand for the opening song. He is exalted, the King is exalted on high. I will praise Him. He is exalted forever.
Oh, remain standing for opening prayer. Sorry, my apologies. Gracias. Gracias. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for another opportunity to come together. Um, and we know, God, that where we are gathered in your name, you're here. So, God, we thank you for being here in our midst. And also, God, we thank you for your desire to be here in our hearts. Uh, be with us now as we continue through this chapel service, Lord. Uh, allow your Holy Spirit to move, speak to us, convict us, encourage us, empower us, God, and help us to be more and more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Good morning, everyone. You've heard Young Preachers Club, the Spanish Pre Preachers Club, yes. the French Preachers Club, yes. and now, for the first time in greatest history, we have the Teachers Preachers Club. Yes. All, well, most of greatest teachers, staff, and faculty have come together to present one spirit-filled sermon. 18 speakers with, in one minute. This is not in order, but the list of speakers is here. Mr. Patterson, our beloved principal, who goes to Queen's Faith. We have Ms. Molly, who goes to Co-op SDA. We have Mr. Romain, Gethsemane SDA. Mr. McDonald, Shelter Rock SDA. We have Miss Elliott with Queensboro SDA. We have Miss Walker who goes to Wakefield SDA. We have Mr. S who goes to Luzo Brazilian SDA. We have Miss Deanna Ryan who goes to Sharon SDA. We have Mr. Arias who goes to Spanish Prospect. We have our former principal, Mrs. Mitchell who goes to Biula. We have Mrs. Madison, who goes to Jackson Heights SDA. We have our conference official, Mrs. Romeo, who also goes to Jackson Heights SDA. We have Mrs. Valson, who goes to Hempstead SDA. And we have Mrs. Santiago, who goes to Old Westbury. On behalf of Greater's Religion Department, we hope and pray that you are blessed by this sermon. But before you hear this wonderful, spirit-filled sermon, we will have our special music by Rachel V, accompanied by the pianist.
Matthew 5, verses 1 and 2. When Jesus saw even more crowds coming, he walked apart a little bit, and he climbed up on a mountain, and the disciples saw him and followed right after him. And when they were there, all the disciples sat around him close to him, and he taught them, and this is what he said. in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? Does it mean to be lacking the spirit of God? Does it mean to be financially speaking of recognizing our We must rid ourselves of our spiritual pride and the idea that we don't need God. To be poor in spirit is to realize Nothing to offer God. To be poor in spirit is to realize our state of destitution. To be poor in spirit is to realize we will have no choice but to accept the gift of salvation, the kingdom of heaven. Our good works can't get us into heaven. Our academic achievements can't get us into heaven. Our riches can't get us into heaven. We are powerless to do that on our own. In order to receive the riches in heaven, we must be spiritually poor. Be humble, because as Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Does Jesus care when I've tried and failed to resist some temptation strong when for my deep grief I find no Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. The word mourn denotes a feeling of sadness, loss, and despair. Looking over at the vast multitude made up of his disciples, widows with broken hearts, the ignored, the lonely, the unloved, the invisible, and I'm sure on the outskirts, maybe even some Pharisees, Jesus spoke to their heart's desire. He said, I see you. I know you. I love you. Some religious scholars have said that this morning relates to those who are grief-stricken over their sinful state. 
But whatever the circumstance or context, Jesus pronounced his blessings on them and gave them himself as their comfort. You are blessed for God is your comfort. You are blessed because you have realized your need of a savior and have accepted his comfort. God's blessing is not reserved only for some, but as Jesus often states, for those whom the Father has given me. God has declared you are blessed and no earthly pontiff or magistrate can denounce that blessing. He will stretch forth his hand into your situation and work it out for your good. We are not meant to get comfortable in this world, but while we wait for his return, God has promised to dry our tears and forgive our sins. Let his promise be your comfort and his presence the soothing solve to your fears. God's promise of comfort is not just a future reward, it's a present gift. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. What is the word meek? What is meekness? The word meek from the Greek language was used to describe reigning in a horse, and particularly a stallion. It is the idea of a horse being controlled by a bit and a bridle. That is meekness. It is power under control. Proverbs 16.32 says, He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who captures a city. And in contrast, the individual who is not quiet, not quite gentle, is likened to a city that is broken into and without walls. Gentleness always uses its resources appropriately. Unlike the out-of-control emotions that are so often are destructive and have no place in our lives. 1 Peter 3, 4 says this, The unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit is precious in God's sight. Meekness is the attitude of the heart and mind that prepares the way for sanctification. If we are meek, it is then we become teachable. Meekness is not a weakness. It is power under control. Falling in love with Jesus. Falling in love with Jesus. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. I often say the word to students, righteousness. Doing right. I'd like to submit to you that the metaphors hunger and thirst don't resonate with us as much today as it was in Jesus' time, where food was really scarce and water, it was a desert. And so in our context, I'd like to speak to you just a little bit for 40 seconds. If you look in front of our school, you'll see a tree there with roots yearning for water and food. It spreads all over. On Friday in my garden, I saw all these plants that needed water. Here at Greater, we have students who have this insatiable thirst, this yearning for knowledge. Notice the physical water, the mental water. You're consumed by it. All of those are finite. God says in John 6 35, come on to me and you will never be hungry and you will never be thirsty. Falling in love with Jesus. Amen. 
Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. Mercy, the act of compassion and kindness shown to someone whom it is in one's power to punish or harm. The part of this definition that stood out to me was not so much the act of showing compassion and kindness because we know that's what mercy is, but showing compassion and kindness when we are in the right, when it is in our power to inflict pain and harm. As sinful, broken creatures, we are bound to hurt one another. It is not an if, but a when. And it is in those moments when one has wronged us and when we are in a position to wrong them back that God asks us to show others what he gives to us each and every day, mercy. Notice I said mercy and not forgiveness. Forgiveness is overcoming anger and resentment, but mercy is withholding harsh treatment one has a right to inflict. So when someone spreads lies or betrays you and you have the opportunity to spread an ugly truth about them, choose mercy. When you have the opportunity to spill the tea about someone who's spread your business to the entire student body, choose mercy. When someone's hurt you, and you can hold a grudge or cut them off, choose mercy. Whatever situation you are in, when the world tells you to respond by hurting, God calls us to respond with healing. Great New York Academy, if there's one thing you remember from my brief message today, remember this. Mercy is the vaccine that repairs and restores broken relationships. The next time and every time it is within your power or right to hurt or harm someone, always choose mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. More than an organ that pumps blood around the body, the heart is, metaphorically, what we are in the secrecy of our thoughts. It represents the deep, private recesses of our lives that no one can see but God. Yes. It represents man's moral nature, intellect, and will. For something to be pure, it must not be defiled, polluted, or mixed with impurities. So the pure in heart are those who have the one goal of seeking God and allowing nothing to take his place in their lives, allowing nothing to defile, to pollute, or to adulterate the relationship, allowing no iniquity or sin to take root in their heart. The psalmist David cried out for a clean heart in Psalm 51.10, Create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit in me. And Psalm 24, verses 3 through 4, says, who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one that has clean hands and a pure heart. Yes. Seeing God is the goal of being pure. The pure in heart will see God in the sense that they can more clearly understand his plans for their lives and walk in a way that pleases him and helps others. They will be admitted into his presence. They will see him in his beauty and by beholding him, will be changed and become agents of change. Protect your heart. Guard it against sinful things and against even good things that have the potential to steal your affections. I submit to you that this beatitude is the climax of all the beatitudes because it brings the greatest blessing, that of seeing God. In the words of Pastor Gregory Brown, as seeing and knowing God becomes our highest pursuit in life, there will be no cost that we are unwilling to pay and no height that we are unwilling to climb to know him. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they and they alone will see God. Lord, purify our hearts. Amen. <laughs> Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Amen. What a treasure is a peacemaker in the family, in the home, in the church, 
at school, in your neighborhood, and in the world. They look to Jesus, copying his pattern, and receive the peace that Christ alone can give. A consecrated Christian life is ever shedding light in comfort and peace. It is characterized by purity, tact, simplicity, and usefulness. The sweet savor of Christ surrounds them. The fragrance of the life, the loveliness of the character, reveal to the world the fact that they are children of God. Amen? Amen. People take knowledge of them that they have been with Jesus. They soothe irritated feelings, prevent rash impulses, and quell evils by words of calm wisdom. He who has the meek and lowly spirit of Christ will be peacemakers. Such a spirit provokes no quarrel, gives back no angry answers, makes the home happy, and brings the sweet peace that blesses all around them. Amen? Amen. Blessed are those who, thank you, Ro, are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We all have a job. We all have a duty, not only to one another, but to God. So should we follow the crowd, or should we stand up for the right? Should we do what everyone else is doing? Or should we do what God asks us to do? So, blessed are those who are persecuted for the right cause. For you will see God. Hello? Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltness, its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Everybody say bless, 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 bless. 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 I'm blessed in the city. I'm blessed in the field. I'm blessed at greater. And you are blessed outside. So I am talking about two concepts today. The concept of being blessed and the concept of being the salt. Can you all say blessed? Can you all say salt? salt. Blessed? blessed. Salt. salt. You see, the word blessed was first used by the ancient Jews when God was in the middle of them. So once the God, God was in the middle of the house, they said, this house is blessed. Yes. So once God is in your midst, you are blessed. Yes. When God is in your heart, you are blessed. Yes. So when God is with you, you are blessed. So because God is with you, you are the salt of the earth. Because wherever you are, you bring taste to the mouth of everyone. Wherever you are, they look up to you because God is with you. Hence, children of the living God. Because God is here, God is with you, you are the salt of the earth. Hence, if you remove yourself, how can you put it back in? 
Hence, I beseech you today to remain in God because thou art blessed. And this is why we say we are blessed in the city. We are blessed in the field. We are blessed wherever we go because we are children of the living God. God bless you. You are the light of the world. Now, I understand that somebody's taking a part of this, so I have to say just that much. You're the light of the world. But it's interesting to note that the Bible also tells us in John chapter 8, verse 12, I think it is, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. So if he is the light of the world, and if I am the light of the world, it means that I must reflect him. I am not the source of the light. He is the source of the light. So our, our duty is to let Jesus be seen in us. Because as people look to us, they must not so much see us as see Jesus. He is the light. So may he be seen in us in all that we do so that his light might shine through us to others. A light that is hidden is of no purpose. If we are the light of the world, we must go into the world and the light of the world for Jesus. May this be our duty. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. During the time of Jesus, nights were very, very dark. With no electricity or flashlights, lighting a candle to guide your way during the night was imperative. But not only lighting the candle was necessary, the way you positioned it was also important. If I place the candle on one side of the room, the other side would be too dark. If I place the candle too low to the ground, I wouldn't be able to see anything above. You see, placement is key. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Doing the work given by God is how we distribute his light. Failing to do those good works is like putting a cover over the only lamp in a dark room. Hiding the light makes the lamp useless. So I leave you with this. This little light of mine, how do I let it shine? Have you placed your light of Christ in this world for all to see? Yes. Light is a photographer's best friend. Yes. Is it yours? No. It's a Christian yardstick. Yes. Is it yours? Mm -hmm. As we could look at some places where light can shine effectively. Number one, our neighborhood. Yes. When we're at home, are the neighbors impacted negatively by our outburst? And are they constantly hearing us causing a lot of disruptions? In the church, have we given, out, given time 
to meaningful participation in activities that your peers or those who interact can benefit from. At school, are we being leaders in our own rights? Are we investing in the education we receive? Completing assignments in timely manner? Producing the quality of work to receive excellent grades? Can your teacher say, I am proud of you with your positive approach to learning? In the community, we spend a great portion of day in varied places of work. Are we impacting those around us positively, not cheating the company of their time as we laze around doing nothing? All these are personal questions we have to ask ourselves. Are we a lamp? Are we a lamp? Stand? A candlestick? Or a matchstick? Can we shine any brighter? Do we need to know the volume of light that we are displaying around us and what the impact has on those who come in contact with us from day to day? How do you know if my light is not shining when I walk away from the main source, Jesus Christ, doing things that are outside of the will of God? Remember that light dispels darkness. Therefore, being in this sin-sick world that is covered with so much darkness, we have to tap to the source into the ultimate source of light, which is Jesus Christ. Amen. Having this master power source, we are guaranteed light for eternally. It, sorry. Having tapped into this power source, we are guaranteed light eternally. This is when we are truly reflecting Matthew 5, 16, which says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Amen. Amen. We've heard a lot of different requirements on the Christian. We've heard, be meek, hunger and thirst for righteousness, be merciful, be pure, be peacemakers, celebrate the fact that you're persecuted for righteousness sake, be salt, be light. I don't know about you, but a lot of times I hear these sermons and I leave heavy with a list of things that I must now do. I must, Steve must be perfect. And I want you to know that the requirement on each and every one of us is perfection. And no one is exempt from that. The law says it clearly. Everyone must fit that criteria of perfection. But the Bible also says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God wanted to make it clear. I want you to know what perfection looks like. And then he recognized that my sinful creatures won't be able to be perfect on their own. He did not come to abolish the law. He didn't come to destroy the law. He came to uplift it. He came to magnify it. Why? Because that law is a reflection of himself. He didn't come to abolish it. He came to fulfill it. He said that my people will not be able to fulfill this perfect standard that I've called them to. Why? Because they are sinners. They won't be able to. On their best day, their righteousness is filthy rags. So God said, I'm going to send myself in the form of Jesus to satisfy that requirement for you. 
a brief analogy. You come into Grader on the first day of school, you get a test that covers the curriculum for the whole year. Would you pass it? God says, in Jesus, I've passed that test for you. All you must now do is enroll in the school of knowing about Jesus. Matthew 5, verse 18 says, For verily, if you have it on the screen, I'll read what I have before me. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. And I like this because I love the uh, King James Version. Because many of Jesus' sayings are introduced with the words verily. Sometimes he says it three times. Verily, 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 I say unto you. I believe he introduces it like that to get your attention, to get my attention, to get the attention of his hearers. And Jesus, being the master teacher, knew that he had to get the attention of the people in order to be sure that they were hearing him and that they were going to understand him. The words, verily, I say unto you, that would certainly get my attention. Then he goes on to tell the hearers what he wanted to tell them. He pointed out in the same verse that the law, being an expression of the will of God, and the plan of salvation being an expression of the mercy of God, neither will fail. Yeah. God's mercy is extended to us on a daily basis. Yeah. He will fulfill his promises. His word will stand forever. That's what it means. Nothing, nothing is going to be taken from it. His word will stand forever. God will not modify or alter his expressed will. He is not like man where today we make a promise and tomorrow we change our minds. He does not flip-flop. What he says, he means. There will be no change in the divine precepts to bring them in conformity with man's will. What he says is not to bring them in conformity to your will. It's to bring us in conformity with his will. He will not change his word to meet our desires. A change in the law is no more possible than a transformation of the character of God who changes not. The principles of the law are as permanent as God is. Mark 13 verse 31 states that heaven and earth shall pass away, but his word shall not pass away. God, again, I say, does not change. Therefore, his word will not change. It stands forever. So we need to daily live in accordance with his word. God's word will surely stand forever. In 1 John 2 verse 1, we receive an admonition and a promise. He says, my little children, these things I write to you that you sin not. But the promise is, but if you sin... You have, a, you have an advocate. You have an intercessor with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So do not fear. Do not get all bent out of shape. Do not be discouraged. Jesus intercedes with the Father on your behalf on a daily basis. You just need to call out to him earnestly. He will hear you when you call. He will help you when you fall. The best friend to have is Jesus. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we don't know if it's okay. Um, Actually, no, 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 no. That's an old one. <laughs> this is it. <laughs> uh, you can actually, you don't have to hold it. If you open it this way, it will stand on its own. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay. Whoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. This Bible verse to me means, uh, is referring to the Ten Commandments. The first four Ten Commandments are a relationship that we have with God. And the second six commandments is the relationship we have with others. A love for God, a love for others. Love is the binding principle in God's law. God gave us the Ten Commandments as a standard to live by. However, we cannot, out of our own strength, keep those Ten Commandments. It is through our, not through our own strength, but through, we can do all things through Christ. Philippians 4.13. God wants us to obey the law, not by our, is something that we need to do, that we have to do, or our, our appearance. Uh, he wants us to obey the law because we love him. Right. We love him with all our heart. Yeah. We love him with all our mind. We love him with all our strength. I love God's covenant for all of us because he tells us it's, it's a beautiful covenant that he has given us. I love you with an everlasting love. Yes. I want to save you. Yeah. And our response to him is loving obedience. Yeah. My prayer for all of us is to have a relationship with God, to study God's word, to pray and to share his love to everyone. And our response will, lead, will be loving obedience to him. Amen. God bless you. I know that God is with you. You cannot keep any law or anything unless you have that relationship with God and you give him that love. All right, and lastly, for I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the five seas and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. I love, and it amazes me, the paradox of the love of Christ. Because he's telling us that unless our righteousness is higher, we will not enter heaven. Mm -hmm. And the only way to do that is by putting ourselves lower so Christ can be lifted higher. Come on, come on. It's amazing. And this is the one reason why I always say that Dominicans came from, from Jesus Christ. <laughs> because he tells you everything all the blessings you can get from everything you do, from being persecuted, from being hungry for the word of Christ, from being a light, from being the salt, everything. And at the end, he's telling you, at the end, he's reminding you that none of this is for your own glory. None of this is for you to feel yourself or your, of yourself. None of this is for you to put yourself on a higher standard or place, but for you to recognize that without Christ, we will never get nowhere. For you to recognize that unless you put yourself on a lower position and a Christ in a higher position, you will never accomplish anything. So the end of all this message is that if you want to be greater, then Christ has to be the greatest. Amen.
church say amen let the church say amen God has spoken let the church say amen let the church say amen let the church say amen God has spoken, so let the church say amen. Weren't you guys a blessed today? This chapel was exciting. It was spirit-filled. We heard singing from teachers. We heard testimonies. And we heard biblical ex explanations, but most of all, we heard Jesus through each teacher. Don't you think we should hear this every year? Shouldn't this be an annual thing? Amen. On behalf of the religion department, I just want to thank all these teachers, especially the, the teachers that had to come from far, just to come here to give us this message. And I want you guys to stand and take a bow one last time. Amen, everybody. Amen, everybody. Today, what I will never, ever forget this day. Today, my heart was warmed. And we acted as a family. One sermon, 18, 18 speakers. God be praised. God be glorified. This is what Greater New York Academy is about. And at this moment, I'm going to invite everyone to stand as we praise God together. That kind of loving Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the messages through each one. But most of all, Lord, we thank you as Sister Sophia, Sophia said, thank you that we have heard Jesus through all of them. Lord, may Jesus penetrate our hearts. May he transform our characters. And may he use us to save others. Lord, I pray that you bless each speaker. Bless their families, their children, grandchildren, those who have. Bless their homes. Bless them in health, in finance. Bless them in retirement. Bless them all around. And we pray, O oh God, that you will speed up that day that you would burst the clouds of heaven so that when you come, all of us and those that we have labored, labored for will make it into your eternal kingdom. Thank you again for today. Thank you, Lord, for how you have used them, the sacrifices by each one and the work that they put in. We give you praise, the honor, and the glory. Thank you for those online. Lord, I pray that you bless them too. And bless Greater New York Academy in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. One seventeen. You'll return from lunch. One seventeen. It will not be seniors, teachers. You may stand and leave first. 